Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are super excited to be here. Um, we're going to give just a second for folks to pop in and, and get on the stream. And um, then we're going to jump into stories and, and questions and all sorts of things. So we'll just give a couple minutes here. But as folks are starting to pop in, even though we're going to introduce ourselves first and all sorts of stuff, um, feel free to go ahead and start putting in questions. We're going to try to hit as many questions as humanly possible as we as we move through. Please be compassionate with us because there are always lots of awesome questions that we might not get to everybody's. But um, I know we will definitely make sure that y'all have resources to reach out um, if we do not get, get there through our time together. Um, so I'm, I know I'm on quite a few NoCD streams and IOCDF streams, but this is my first time with Julia, who I'm really, really excited to be here with. Um, so Julia, if you want to introduce yourself um, a little bit and, and share a little bit about your story, and sure. I'm sure folks are excited to hear from you. Um, I've been doing this webinars. I've done a couple of them before, and um, I went through my uh, personal very horrible OCD experience around three years ago, and um, it completely changed my life to before and after. And it was very, very difficult experience dealing with a lot of different teams and not knowing what's going on with me and thinking that I'm just absolutely losing my mind. It was very, very scary. And um, finally, um, when I was able to get my recovery under control and get my OCD under control, I just, uh, I just knew that I have to do something to share my experience with other people and just help um, and just help others to deal with this and just uh, give a little bit of hope and uh, help share my experience to make the process of recovery a little um, easier. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And I know that so many folks on here love love hearing from you and love knowing that you're doing this to make sure that others are able to live a beautiful life and, and find recovery. Um, and I connect with that. That's very much what, what my story is all about. Um, I am an ordained minister who's navigated OCD since around the time of, of eight, have been through pretty much every theme imaginable from things related to contamination, to checking, to harm, to false memories, to real event, to um, POCD, pretty much anything that you can imagine. Um, but really had um, a pretty major relapse a couple of years ago in the midst of supporting um, my school community as a minister through a series of traumas and tragedies and ended up feeling like I was just this horrific person, um, navigating very much false memory OCD along with moral scrupulosity and really buying into the fact that I was responsible for a lot of the traumas that my community was experiencing. Um, and for those of you that know my story, <laughs> you know that I was so private about this beforehand and didn't want anybody to know that a member of the clergy had OCD and had intrusive thoughts. And coming out of this experience, really wanted to make sure that folks know that Everybody has thoughts, intrusive thoughts. Thoughts are thoughts are thoughts, um, even clergy and everyone. So many people struggle with, with mental health type struggles and um, that there is so much hope through things like exposure and response prevention. And we're here to answer a lot of questions about that tonight. Um, but folks, as you're putting questions in the chat, um, I want you to hear from us that there is so, so, so much hope. Um, I've heard a lot of conversation recently about the fact that OCD is something that you live with throughout your life. And that's true. That's very much true for me. And yet, by having the skills and tools and acknowledging that it's there, you can live this beautiful, awesome life that's not dictated by OCD. So... Yeah, go ahead. I think I actually, um, I ha I actually had a lot of anxiety around just having this term of like OCD is so chronic, uh, because it creates just like this um, idea that you're going to struggle with your system uh, symptoms every day of your life for the rest of your life, and um, I came to realization that it's actually it's not the case. It is chronic, meaning that if you're gonna give in into your compulsions, it's gonna come back. Um, it's the same uh, with, it's the same thing as like having diabetes and if you start eating unhealthy diet your symptoms are going to come back but if you're living a healthy life 
you're not really bothered by those symp- by the symptoms anymore and you're just living your life and enjoying every day so um i f- what i learned to understand is that ocd is chronic meaning that managing ocd is chronic um but it doesn't mean that you're gonna have symptoms every single day of your life for the rest of your life and you're just gonna feel anxious hopeless or scared um i think that that's something that stopped me for sure and uh was a huge roadblock for me at the beginning um to kind of realize that ocd like what ocd is so i just thought that i would just uh put that uh and just you know share my thoughts on that Mm -hmm. I love that you said that. And I agree. I think it's so scary when we hear that, right? And I love, um, Shala nicely wrote an article a while back on this and how like it's chronic, but that doesn't mean it's terminal. It's not Mm -hmm. this thing where we're going to be suffering, like you said, and struggling every day. It's, oh, I have OCD and I can develop these skills and tools um, to live this life where you don't have to be wrestling with it every single day and and recognizing thoughts or thoughts or thoughts and stuff pops up, but you can live a beautiful life. Like, like um, we are here and that doesn't mean we don't struggle, but it also doesn't mean that every day is really hard. Um, it means that things can be, can be beautiful. So I'm going to jump into, into questions. Okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. Um, Julie, if you want to, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on this. My OCD has manifested as sleep anxiety lately. My fears are so intense and catastrophic that sometimes I feel like I'm never going to sleep normally again. Any tips? Lucy, I've been there. Oh my God, I know how it feels. Honestly, I feel like that's the strategy that works the best for me. Uh, but I'm really, um, I'm really uh, attaching OCD a lot to, to the way your brain works. And basically, whatever you show your brain that is important, your brain is going to think you're in danger. You're thinking about that and you're getting scared. So I need to make sure that they keep you safe. That's why I need to send you even more signals like that, even more anxiety, even more thoughts about your sleep. So um, the more attention you pay, uh, like the more attention you pay to this whole idea of like sleep and um, you ruminate about it and you stress about it you're never like, it, it, it's just going to get harder for you. So um, really working on rumination, trying to reduce rumination around your sleep and being very sarcastic with your OCD also can be very helpful saying like, yeah, probably never going to sleep again ever in my life. I'm not going to be able to fall asleep. And then your OCD sends another thought to you and you say, yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. And also um, going to bed with the idea that I don't care if I'm going to fall asleep or not. I'm just going to bed. I'm creating this space to fall asleep for myself. If I do, it's good. If I'm not going to sleep, just work on having this kind of attitude that like, if I go to sleep, if I fall asleep, great. If I'm not going to fall asleep, I'm just going to rest my body and I'm just going to lay down and I'm not going to think about that. What do I you love- think? I I love that you said everything I was thinking and especially I love this sarcasm and that's such a big thing for me too with my OCD of being able to say, yep, okay, probably not, probably never going to sleep ever again, never going to happen for me. I'm just going to be completely awake for the rest of my life. And um, I love, I love everything that you said and it's about sitting with the uncertainty with that, just like, like everything else. Yeah, because the more you show your brain that it's important, the more it's going to keep sending you the same signals, same feelings, same emotions, same thoughts, similar thoughts. And then when you're going to try to figure something out or try to um, reassure yourself that you're going to fall asleep and you're going to have a good night rest, your OCD is going to come back at you. You're never going to win if you play by the rules like that. We like... ERP has this like strategy. It's a winning strategy that if you play by ERP rules, you're going to beat OCD because you're not going to feed it anymore. You're not going to give it any food to eat. So it's just going to starve to death and just uh, leave you alone because, again, you're going to show your brain that it's not important. It's irrelevant. And you're going to live your life the way you would with OCD or without OCD. Just living your life and enjoying like every single day and just pretending like you don't even have it. Maybe I will fall asleep. Maybe I will not. Who knows? I don't care. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. 
Okay. So we have your majesty at 803 says I have harm OCD and like watching crime shows, but they give me so much anxiety um, that I'm bad, but I still like the show. Does this mean anything? Um, so I definitely feel some reassurance in this question, which I, I do the exact same thing um, around this area. And um, I think for a lot of folks with harm OCD, yeah, those crime shows may give you anxiety. Um, I'm somebody that harm OCD was a really big thing for me where I was very concerned that I was dangerous, that I could complete a violent act that, oh my goodness, maybe I've committed some sort of violent act and forgot about it or blocked it out all of these different things. And for folks listening here, um, the reason that our brains tend to get stuck on these things is they're the things that are the most significant and most important to us. So generally, if you are stuck on thoughts of harm, not to offer reassurance, but it's probably because um, being a kind person or engaging in ways that are respectful are important to you. At the same time, watching a crime show for somebody with harm OCD can be a fantastic exposure as long as you're not using um, things to make yourself feel better as a part of the process, making sure you're doing the response prevention. So if you're watching it and you're saying, oh, I'm not like that character, check, I'm definitely not like that, and checking as you go, probably not helpful. But if you're using it as an exposure or like you noted, just because you enjoy crime shows... I would say that probably doesn't mean anything bad about you. To throw in a little exposure, who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But I'll say I really like crime shows too. They kind of stress me out and I still watch them because I think a lot of human beings just happen to like crime shows and it doesn't mean anything else other than we like crime shows. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you go on Netflix or Google and then you search for movies, most of them are like, you know, a big part of them would be like some kind of crime shows and, uh on Netflix, very often you see like number number one in US today, some kind of crime show. Uh, and uh, it just doesn't mean that every single person is like a bad person for watching that. It's just some exciting stuff that people like to watch. But then your OCD it's like, right. just <laughs> takes that. Yeah. And your OCD is like, oh, I see. That's something that like she's like unsure about. So let's see if I can latch on to that and just see if I can, you know make make you worry about that for a little bit and see how that goes and then it just like kind of keeps like a little like feet in the water and then you react and then it's like oh yeah nice i can just send all the anxiety because we can launch onto this team and just uh create a lot of stress over that so being aware of that and also um i really like what you said that it goes against your beliefs your core beliefs and um I think for a while I used that as a reassurance for myself when I had some kind of some uh, harm OCD thoughts. And then I would just ask myself, like, am I really that person? Do I feel like that? Do I like, do, is it really who I am at the core? Is that what I value? Like caring about people and not wanting any harm to anyone. And I quickly realized that that's turning into a compulsion too to ruminate, to prove to myself that I'm that kind of person. So um, I think it's very, very important to recognize once that these are my values, but then make sure that you don't use that as a reassurance for yourself in the future. And the best thing, again, is just to show your brain that that stuff is irrelevant. It comes in, it comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's whatever. Your OCD is trying to trick you. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that about the reassurance too, because I agree. It's great to be able to note, and especially on streams like this where we're saying, okay, like if somebody has harm OCD, it's it's not something to be alarmed about. It's just their brain. It's because it's important to them. But like you said, not using that as reassurance. Um, my therapist a long time ago used to really catch me on that because I would say, okay, so I must be a good person because I'm really worried I'm going to do something horrible to people. And she used to make fun of it and call it my noble OCD. And she would say, yes, you and your noble OCD, you and your OCD always being noble. And it's like, it's really not, not helpful to reassure yourself in that way um, because OCD is OCD is OCD, which yeah. actually leads really well into Tom's question that I would love um, your thoughts on this. Does anybody know what creates an intrusive thought? And in my perspective, an intrusive thought is just a thought and we all just have thoughts. So I wonder what you might think about that. Uh, so what I think about that is um, research shows that people have, you know, from like 50 to 70 to 80,000 thoughts a day. 
and then um basically like research also also shows that like 95 percent of people have um intrusive thoughts and the other five percent are probably lying i'm 100 percent like i'm sure about that or maybe they're not lying maybe they just um got to the I point noticed. where it's so ir- irrelevant to them that they don't even care uh but for somebody with ocd People with OCD often are very nice, very kind. Um, they don't want to hurt anybody else or they don't want to cause any inconvenience for anybody else. So when that thought occurs to them, it creates this initial reaction of anxiety. And then your brain reacts to that immediately and says, oh, okay, this like little box, I need to check that box because um, in your brain because like that's something that scared you. The amygdala doesn't understand. It doesn't know the language. It only reacts to your emotions, how you reply to the thought. It doesn't know the language. It doesn't know logic. So when uh, when um, OCD when a thought occurs to somebody who is about to develop OCD, they react with fear, with stress. It creates a fear. It, it creates the sense of crisis, um, urgency to uh, reassure that nothing bad is going to happen. And uh, that's how the cycle starts, because then a person tries to reassure themselves, try to find a relief. Then even if it happens for a second, the loop starts again, because by showing that you need to give reassurance to the thought, you're showing your brain that the problem is actually there. It exists and it's uh, it's a serious problem that you need to work on and and you need to figure this out. So the only way out of it is to teach your amygdala that um, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do any mental review. You don't have to do any mental or physical compulsions. You can sit with anxiety and slowly reteach your brain to let go of anxiety and um, make that topic irrelevant. Because our brain, even from evolutionary standpoint, doesn't need to hold anything that's irrelevant. It just doesn't need to pay attention to that. So the more you give power to your OCD, the more it just goes back into the loop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I love I love how you address that with the thought piece. Is it's really the power that we're giving the thoughts, um, and and we can really make a choice at any point in that cycle to stop the cycle. And it, it might not be comfortable, but what makes an intrusive thought an intrusive thought? It isn't um, anything outside of the fact that we're giving it attention, that we're giving it energy. We happen to have OCD. So we're going to become even more stuck on those things that we are offering that attention and that energy. Um, And I hear so often from folks, probably almost every day, oh, I feel like I'm getting sick again. I have those intrusive thoughts or those intrusive thoughts were really bad today. And I think it's a really great idea to stop basing your recovery or base on base basing how you're doing on whether or not you're having intrusive thoughts because again thoughts are thoughts are thoughts and and like Julia shared we all have thoughts we all have weird bizarre strange thoughts generally the people who say they don't yeah are probably lying or just don't notice them and um and it's not about that it's about our response to the thoughts it's always about the response so recovery when we talk about that is not an absence of intrusive thoughts because that's just not a reality for not just folks with ocd but human beings recovery is about the ability to see that thought and say like, oh, nope, not going to give that attention. I'm going to move on with my life. Um, And that's really what's important and what we're trying to teach with ERP. Yeah. And for Tom, uh, it is hard. And I'm so sorry for that your son is going through that. I've been there myself. I know how hard it can get. And um, um, it's really hard to go from like, you know, ruminating 24 seven or having um, OCD attacking you and being in this crisis mode 24 seven and then just stop. I feel like it's impossible. So it takes a lot of work and the work is hard and it really makes you feel uncomfortable because you have to accept your anxiety. And instead of pushing it away, you have to just sit with your anxiety and just let it run Uh, and kind of take you over for some time so it definitely can be very hard it goes against our intuition and against our nature because I feel like we're as a human beings we're like it's in our nature to try to do everything to make us feel comfortable Mm -hmm. Um, so the process is tough but it's more than possible and sharing that with your son maybe would be a very good some kind of um, 
like words, some words of hope, uh, because it can get very scary and very um, hopeless. Like you can feel very bad because it feels like nothing is ever going to work to make it better. But there are some great tools that definitely can get you back on track and make you your life even better than it was before the OCD. Thank you, Julia. That, that's a great transition actually to a question about what treatment looks like. So um, we have a question here at 805 that says, after beginning ERP, how long does it take to um, take effect to significantly reduce OCD? So we've talked a little bit about ERP, but for folks who might just be jumping on or not be familiar, um, ERP is the gold standard treatment for OCD, exposure and response prevention. And we're really trying to break that cycle that Julia was talking about just a second ago when we become fused with our thoughts. And the idea is that you're being exposed or you're exposing yourself with the help of a clinician to things that are really uncomfortable to you, to things that are very intrusive or that are, that are very scary, that you're very afraid of. And rather than doing a compulsion or seeking reassurance or, or something to make that anxiety go down, you're engaging in response prevention. So you're allowing your anxiety to go up, 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 and you're letting it stay there without doing anything to bring it down over time to show your brain that you're able to handle that anxiety. Um, and over time, the goal is habituation, but also really just showing yourself that you're capable of handling whatever that feeling and emotion that's coming up for you might be. For a lot of people, that might be fear and anxiety. I know I hear from a lot of folks that that shame and guilt, um, same kind of thing, where we're trying to allow those emotions to be there. But in terms of how long it takes to significantly reduce OCD, um, and Julie, I'll be curious your thoughts, but in my experience, it really varies for everyone. And generally when someone says, oh, it's going to take this exact amount of time, mm, I wouldn't necessarily go with that. It's going to be very different for each person. Um, clients that I work with, with faith in OCD, it takes a whole scope of different amounts of time, depending on the work that they're doing. It can, of course, depend if they're doing outpatient treatment or inpatient treatment or what that looks like, how long the obsession's been there, um, how willing they are to engage in the exposures and to do that response prevention piece. Um, but I think one of the really important things and one of the big turning points for me is I spent so long looking for my OCD to get better. And it was like every day I would wake up and say, do I feel better yet? Okay, why don't I feel better yet? Okay, like what's wrong with me? Why is everybody else feeling better and I'm not feeling better yet? And it actually took until the point that I stopped asking the question of when is my OCD going to get better for me actually to start to feel better. Um, and I think the feeling comes long after the behavioral piece. Like over time, you learn to not respond to those things that are really scary. And it still might feel really, really hard for a while, but when you stop checking to see if it's hard, eventually those feelings um, follow. But I know that can be challenging because, again, for me, every day I woke up and said, why don't I feel better yet? Like, why don't I feel better yet? But it does come. Um, what are your thoughts, Julia? I love what you said to the point, you know, 100%. Stop chasing the feeling of relief because when you do, again, you show to your brain that this topic this idea this situation is important that's why your brain just keeps keeps like holding on to that and also treat any feelings and any emotions as a symptom when you have a flu you don't just wake up every morning and think oh my god my throat still hurts ah oh, something you take care of the problem and then symptoms go away so treat any feeling that comes with OCD, any sensation, any urge, um, idea, images, thoughts, anything. Treat it as a OCD symptom. Irrelevant. I'm not going to pay attention. Brain, you can come up with any idea that you want. I'm not going to play into that anymore. I'm just going to move on with my life. Yeah, you can send my the, these feelings these thoughts all day long i'm not going to react to that anymore and the more you try to chase the feeling of relief um you know the farther it gets from you unfortunately that's when you just relax and put the priority on treatment that's when the feeling comes and it unfortunately also it comes last 
um but it does it does it's for sure does it's work you thought your brain you spent so much time teaching your brain that that's the feelings that you should be feeling as a result of the thoughts that you have and now it's going to take some time to reteach your brain the other way so it's very much on uh it's autopilot right now um so um it takes definitely different amount of time for different people um to recover and i feel like it also a lot depends on um how willing uh you are to do the work and sit with this uncomfortable feeling of anxiety and uh, uh because you know if you do erp for a little bit and then you don't for like a day and then you do a little bit again and then you don't you're just confusing your brain even more your brain is like, I don't know what to do. Like, I'll, I'll send a little bit uh, of the thoughts. I don't, I'm not going to send. I'll do it a little bit. I'll send anxiety. To, to tomorrow, I'm not going to do it. And it gets very confused. So it needs to be very steady. You need to be very consistent with what you're teaching your brain. It's like, it, 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 it's really like, you know, like math problem, like a math. Like, really, you're just have a formula that you need to do. Just make sure that you keep following the formula and you'll get the result that you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I love, um, I, I love that, that you brought this up. The, it's a consistent thing that you have to continue to engage in, in this way. And I think for me, one of, of my really big struggles was the fact that I was really good at the exposures. It's like, Oh, I can get my anxiety up really, really easily. But the response prevention, I think I didn't realize how unwilling I was to engage in the response prevention for such a long time. It was like I could do the RP part when I was with my therapist and then I would leave and I would continue to ruminate. I would continue to compulse, engage in those ways that it was completely undoing the exposure piece. And um, I have to give credit because I, I feel like I take his stuff all the time and then he gets irked. So my my partner who also has OCD, Ethan Smith, so I won't steal it from him, but he always talks about how there's this this last little piece um, in terms of your recovery where you have to make that final leap. And it's totally up to you. It's totally your choice. And he talks a lot about how definitely sometimes people stay in a space where they continue to negotiate with the OCD. But we have this choice um, kind of at the end of the journey where you can take that extra little leap and say, okay, I am willing to not engage. I am willing to not engage and try to make myself feel better. And I'm willing to do that for the shot at this big, beautiful life that I want. And it took me a really long time to get to that point. And some days that's still really tough. But for me, I think that last step and that willingness to really not respond to that exposure component is what helped me um, to reclaim the life that I wanted so badly to have. Um, and let's see. And Julia's back. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's okay. You're totally fine. Um, no, that was, that was, that's perfect. Okay. Actually. So here's another really good question here. Um, I love this. I'm a college student. And so lately I've been trying to deal with my obsession over not failing exams. I'm scared my OCD will get in the way and that it means I'm simply not intelligent. Um, any thoughts, Julia? Uh, well, again, another example of how OCD really um, goes after something that's very important to you. And I feel like when you're a student, um, y- your education is probably one of the most important things and one of the main things that you're concentrating on. So it's just trying to go after that and trying to get um, trying to get that anxiety and reaction out of you. Um, I definitely had that. Um, it was very hard. For me a lot of times to even like concentrate because the more you try to stress about it because you're trying to find an answer or a relief the worse it gets so um again i think like it's very classic for a lot of college students uh, that experience ocd to have this team uh and it sounds very classic to me you know like very classic ocd i've been trying to deal with my obsessions over not um failing exams so I'm just curious, what exactly, like, trying to deal with my obsessions, what exactly are you doing? I would look into that and just see, are you doing rumination? Are you doing reassurance? Are you doing, like, self-reassurance or reassurance from others? Um, what exactly is your, um, like, obsession, uh, the compulsion piece about that? And really try to work on that and try to reduce it. If you can do it, like, right away, try to reduce it and do it slowly. And um, 
really like recognize what is the compulsion and just go like towards that you know mm-hmm. it's the ocd i'm not going to pay attention i'm gonna sit with anxiety a thought can come in a thought it's just it thought it's just a thought it's not a fact mm-hmm. it's just trying to scare me i don't care i'm not paying attention to this anymore mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and give yourself lots and lots and lots of compassion. This is, this is tough. So I'm, I'm a school chaplain and work with a lot of folks getting ready to go to college. And this is, it's so, so difficult um, in this point in life for folks who have OCD and, and please give yourself compassion. I think when you're in the midst of school, when you're in the midst of education, it's, it's really tough when you're feeling, um, when you're hearing your professors or hearing family members say, okay, you have to do well, you have to do well. And you have that added pressure of OCD where you're already in your mind saying, I have to do well, I have to do well, I have to do things right. It's really complicated. So on top of all of the amazing things Julia said, please give yourself a big hug and love and compassion and know that you are doing great, however it is that that you're doing. Um, and I was definitely one who tried to be perfect with grades in college and still do actually with grad school sometimes and have to take a step back and remind myself that my worth is is not dependent on on the grade at the end of the day, um, which I know can be really, really hard. Okay, so Shelly, this is a great question. How do you get back on track after an OCD relapse? I've been doing well for a while after undergoing ERP, but a recent move triggered a relapse in intense OCD symptoms. Um, And Shelly, first I, I would say, Um, This is so tough. And um, I've been there. I think sometimes when we move through ERP and we're experiencing recovery from OCD, um, we get in this place of, okay, like I'm done. I'm never going to have these experiences ever again. Check, check, check. And it's really difficult when we start to have stuff pop up again and when things start to get really sticky again. Um, First, I would I would note that I think a lapse and a relapse are really different. I think it's easy for us to immediately jump to this place of I'm relapsing and I'm going down this whole rabbit hole again. And we can really catch ourselves early on. Um, And I've learned this more recently that we can do something and realize I'm having a little bit of a lapse. And you know what? I'm going to make the choice to not continue to engage in this compulsion. And we can come back from this really quickly. Um, But if you do get to a a space of experiencing kind of a full-blown relapse in terms of OCD, the the great thing is you've already done the work in the past. You know the things that you need to do. You have participated and engaged in ERP. It's dusting off those tools. It's, It's bringing them back out. And it's knowing that just like they worked that first time around, they're going to work again. And it's easy to feel like we're starting back all the way at the starting line and we're going to have to go through that same whole journey that we did. But knowing that you've been there, your brain is going to respond maybe even more easily than it did the first time because you've used those tools, you've used those those skills before. So trust that a relapse doesn't mean that you failed. It means that you have OCD and life sometimes gets hard and OCD comes along with it. But that through ERP, you have all the skills and tools that you need to get back to the space that you want to be. I love that. And the best thing is that, um, you know, ERP works no matter how long was your relapse, how many times you relapsed. Every time you try to uh, you apply those tools back, it works because OCD doesn't know. It's not smart. It's smart enough, but it does is not smart enough to uh, overplay ERP. So, um, and uh, to share like a little bit of the personal um, stuff, like I'm also, I've been dealing with a little relapse, uh, which has been kind of hard, Um, but, you know, this kind of hard that I'm experiencing right now is nowhere even near the hard, difficult time that I had before I actually learned about about OCD, about NoCD, about ERP and all the treatment and all the tools. So um, it can feel very discouraging and it can feel very scary and it can feel like, you know, next time ERP is not going to work or what if, what if this is the different time? What if this time it's something is not going to go as well, like as it went last time, but it's just, again, another way OCD is trying to get your attention. And uh, 
uh, one of the very important things to remember is that you know um, when something like this happens, maybe it's because you um, you forgot a little bit the most basic tools. I feel like you got so good probably at doing all the recovery work. And you got to the point where you were feeling so good that you stopped doing the recovery work and then you let yourself, let the anxiety kind of like back in, you know, it's like a little bit like, like a little crack in the foundation and a little bit of water goes in and then just tries to go in from every single, um, every single angle. So remembering that and then doing ERP again, staying on track and being very consistent again, showing to your brain that you can do it, that you're stronger and giving yourself a lot of love and a lot of compassion because it happens and ERP recovery is not, uh, OCD recovery is not linear. It, you're going to have bad moments, you're going to have bad moments, but every relapse that you have is actually, it's making you stronger. It's making you stronger versus OCD. It's another chance for you to practice those tools that you learned and make them even more automatic, even better than uh, they were before. I love what you just said. And I, I always think about that. And I, I say this to folks all the time that every time something pops up, like you said, with a, whether it's a relapse or whether you're noticing an intrusive thought or an uncomfortable emotion, it's like it's an opportunity to fight OCD. It's an opportunity for kind of an ERP on the fly. And um, it, it, for folks listening, it might sound ridiculous, but sometimes, especially if I'm struggling, I'll try to say out loud when something hard pops up, I'll say like, whoa, thanks OCD. Like really appreciate it. This is such a great opportunity to resist right now. Like, wow, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and it sounds so ridiculous, but I think there's something to that of, of really telling your brain like, yes, I'm so ready for the anxiety right now. What an opportunity for me to fight and to show my brain that this isn't, um, a threat, and for y'all to hear, to Julia's point, you know, it's funny, even folks who have been in recovery for quite a while struggle sometimes. Um, I've been in a good place for years. And I'll honestly admit today was actually one of the hardest days I've had with OCD in a long, long, long time. And that doesn't mean that everything is automatically going to, to tank the next couple of days. But I also recognize that I kind of have this choice moving through these next few hours um, and can hold myself accountable. And sometimes I'll even say, is this something I still want to be worried about tomorrow? Or do I want to be living my life at this time tomorrow? And um, the kind of neat thing, maybe the scary thing, but the neat thing is I actually get to choose when I get off of this, this call tonight or get off of this live stream do I want to engage in compulsions and have a really rough next couple of days? Or do I want to sit with the anxiety for a little bit and um, have the chance to live my life for the rest of the week? And ironically, when I put it like that, it sounds really simple um, to myself, even though it's a it's a hard, a hard piece. I love that so much. And it's again keeping yourself very accountable for your OCD recovery because think about it even in the way that. You're going to have to undo, you know, like basically every compulsion that you did. So think about that. If you're going to do a compulsion, you just know that you're going to have to pay for that in the future. So might as well just not do it, mm -hmm. you know, because it's going to make you feel anxious and you know that. And uh, uh, it's very hard because it's counterintuitive and it feels like, you know, you're not even like you're resisting, but you're still doing it. But still, like, you know, push through, sit with anxiety and uh, um, let yourself, it's okay to feel anxiety. It's okay to feel different and scary emotions and difficult emotions. We're human beings and it's normal for us to experience the whole entire range of um, emotions. And uh, when we like try to suppress one of them, it's just going to, you know, come back with even like stronger power. So, yeah. And one more thing that I really thought that I would add is that one of the things that really helped me throughout the recovery and like relapse, uh, for me specifically, OCD was the worst in the mornings. Like, you know, you wake up, you didn't even open your eyes yet and your whole entire OCD experience already there. It's It got reactivated even before you opened your eyes. And really, really, really getting that is a very crucial part of what you're going to do and how you're going to live your day and how strong you're going to be. When you 
wake up and you feel all that, just really try to say to yourself, I am going to be strong and this is the day when I'm going to fight with OCD and I'm going to do my best and I'm going to um, reduce and uh, my compulsions or actually like or refuse to do them at all and I'm going to do all the work. Mm-hmm. This is OCD and I'm just moving on with my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's so funny you said that. I was I with the today. Yeah, it was funny. My my um Instagram post today was make today the day you stand up to OCD, and I posted that this morning. And that's what it is. It's like you get to choose right now in this moment to stand up to OCD, and that can yeah. feel overwhelming, but it's also so cool because you have you have that choice. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna move into this is a question um, I've been getting a lot and I'm, I love your thoughts on this and then I have some thoughts too. So I always feel like I see things about intrusive thoughts, but real event OCD, I feel like the exception. Um, I haven't been diagnosed, but I'm afraid to because real event OCD is my main theme, I think at the moment. So any thoughts on real event OCD or maybe how she might navigate? Um, well, um, I'll tell you, you know, one thing that like 10 out of 10 anxiety feels exactly the same for somebody, somebody have can have an obsession about like just having a thought in their, uh, having like a song in their mind and ruminating about that. And 10 out of 10 anxiety will feel the same for uh, real event OCD, for existential OCD, for harm OCD, for any kind of uh, OCD that you can possibly imagine. So, uh, of course, OCD is trying to tell you, yeah, this is the worst one, you know, this is the worst one. That's why you have to really pay a lot of attention and you have to figure this out. No, it's just another OCD trick. Uh, OCD is OCD. It's not about the theme at all. It's never about the theme. And it makes you feel like it is. But it's, um, but it's not. The team is irrelevant. So um, again, the same thing, ERP work, um, no matter how it feels, do you remember that all your intrusive thoughts and intrusive feelings are just a symptom? Just a symptom. It's not the thing that you have to fight against. What you need to do is to kind of cut the OCD at its core at its root and just start doing the ERP work. And that's how all the symptoms will go away eventually. Thank you. And and I think the real event piece, and I've heard this from a lot of folks, um, and the thing your OCD tends to say around real event OCD for if anyone's watching that um, doesn't know what this is, this is typically something actually took place that the person has some thoughts around that they might be ruminating or repeating in their mind, going back to and saying like, oh my goodness, did this thing make me a horrible person? So it might be well, when I was in second grade, I really did steal that pack of Skittles from the CVS. And what does that mean about me now? Um, and and just like Julia said, it's it's the same as all other forms of OCD. Your brain is just tricking you into thinking that it's something a little different. Um, but I I know that I know this can be particularly tough. This is I've struggled with both false memory OCD and fearing that I did catastrophic things that I didn't actually do, as well as real event OCD um, around aspects of a divorce that I went through, where I thought back over and over around, did I do things correctly? Did I do things appropriately? Did I do something that made me a horrible person? And what I kept coming back to with my therapist was, but I really did go through a divorce. Like this one was real. I know the false memory thing wasn't real, but this really did happen. So how do you know I'm not a bad person? And do I really deserve to be happy? And Abby, that might be what you're experiencing. And the answer is it's still OCD. And OCD is really tricky at telling you, well, this really did happen. So it really must be something to pay attention to. And it's just not. Um, The response is the same as it always is may or may not mean something, may or may not mean something about who I am. It may or may not be OCD. And I'm going to choose to move on with my life and live a beautiful life anyway. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to pay so much attention to this, it's like you're taking this whole um, OCD theme and you just put it like this in front of you. And it makes you feel like, you know, that's the most important. You cannot see anything else. Uh, But there are so many other pieces in life. And uh, the work that you need to do is to not try to push uh, push away your OCD or get rid of that uh, or like not to think about that or suppress it or think about that. 
just put it, you know, it's in your awareness somewhere, it's somewhere here. It can be here, it can go away, it can come back, it can tell me something. It's like a loud neighbor, you know, that's like always yelling in the back and uh, saying something, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna listen to that. You know, it can be there, it can go away, it can come back again, you know, the neighbor can have a loud party tomorrow and then, um, you know, and, and then just go quiet for like another month. No matter, it's not gonna change anything about you. You're just, you know, keep it keep it here not here mm -hmm. yeah i love that i'm sitting here and i'm like okay everything's pink everything's pink everything's <laughs> pink i can't see anything right it can go right here we can still see our life and we still we're not getting rid of it it's there but we can live we can live that we can live that life um okay let's see i'm trying to see if i'm trying to get to some questions that are totally different so sorry i'm scrolling down here um do 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 um, da, da, dun, 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 dun. okay. Okay, cool. We've actually, we've hit a lot of different topics. So that, that makes me, um, feel better. Okay. Um, this is, this is an interesting question. And usually we don't talk about specific medications, but I think it's, it's okay to talk about the experience of self-advocacy with medications and things that that looks like. So how should I self-advocate with my psychiatrist to get prescribed medication for my severe OCD? Um, so I'm really big on, I'm never, um, I never really share that the medications that I take or that I don't take because I want everyone to have those personal conversations with their clinician, with their psychiatrist. Um, and yet I think these are conversations that definitely can happen um, in conjunction with your psychiatrist and with your therapist. And I think in advocating for that, you can have a conversation and you can say, hey, here is where I am as a part of my therapy process. Here's where I am as a part of my therapy journey. And a lot of times that becomes, again, a three-way conversation between your therapist, the one who's helping you engage in that ERP, your psychiatrist, and you um, in a way that's meaningful. The medication piece, um, I always like to bring up because I'm really big on the fact that you should always, always, always still be engaging in ERP for OCD. Um, medication can be so incredibly helpful for folks if that is something that's prescribed to you by your psychiatrist. But um, I like to think of that as a tool that makes the ERP work even more effectively. So for me, for a really long time, I was engaging in ERP and I wasn't necessarily seeing the results that I wanted to. And I'll be honest, I had a lot of stigma in my personal life around medication. I would tell everybody around me, yeah, take your meds. You're totally, totally fine. And for me, one, um, as clergy, because of things I had heard in the church, and two, as an athlete, I was so afraid of medication and my therapist really pushed me into it. I remember sitting out in the car and crying the first time I took meds, thinking that I had completely failed in my ERP journey. And I actually started turning a corner and it ended up helping me more than I can imagine. And the analogy I like to use is um, like the quote by, um, by Viktor Frankl. He says, between stimulus and response, we have a space to choose. We get to make this choice. And sometimes with OCD, as we're engaging in ERP, um, I think things move so quickly that it's hard to actually make that choice. And for me, um, medication made that space a little bit bigger so that I actually had time to use the skills and the tools that I had developed from ERP. So I think it can give you a little extra space to do that as a part of your ERP journey. Um, but these are definitely conversations that you should have as you're engaging in therapy with your therapist and yourself and your psychiatrist. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I think you covered everything pretty great. I think that it can definitely be very helpful. Um, but I also think that it's very important for a lot of people to remember that medication is not going to do the work for you. Mm -hmm gonna push you it's gonna give you that a little bit you know like if um, how I look at it I think it's like if the curve is like that you know and that's like the lowest part where you can get medication is gonna help you not to go that far below like it's gonna keep you it's gonna create that space for you to do the work but unless you do the recovery work that medication you know maybe it will be helpful but I'm not, I'm, I don't know how helpful it's going to be once you stop taking that if you did not recover through therapy and ERP. So I think that um, medication can be a great thing, but definitely, definitely, definitely your top priority must be your recovery work that you do um, 
through exposure and response prevention. Mm -hmm. And I love that you highlighted that one of my kind of cringe moments. And again, I've meds definitely helped me as a part of my journey. But one of my cringe moments is when I talk to somebody that will say, okay, I don't need to engage in ERP. I'm taking my meds. So no big, no big deal. So I'm fine now. I'm like, whoa, okay. Like you definitely should be engaging in ERP and that can be a tool alongside that. Um, but like you said, it's still about you going on that, that recovery. Sure. Work. Okay. So how about, um, okay. Interesting. Um, can journaling be good for OCD? Uh, very interesting question. Um, it depends. It depends what you journal about. I think if you're trying to, and depends how you do it. If you have this urge, this sensation to journal because you need to get this feeling of relief, then I don't think that it's good for your OCD recovery because that just turns into another compulsion. But if you journal just because, you know, I feel like I would journal no matter if I had OCD or if I wouldn't have OCD, I would still sit down and write down some thoughts that I have. Um, if you do it in that kind of mindset, you know, like uh, if it doesn't create a sense of urgency for you, then I think it's good. I think that journaling can be very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts about that? You, you hit on, it's funny, I was gonna have the same response that you did. I was like, um, well, it kind of <laughs> depends, right? Um, I, I think it can. Journaling, um, if it's something that's value-driven that you enjoy, like, yes, don't let OCD prevent you from doing something that's value-driven. But I do think there are certain situations where it can be compulsive. Um, it was for me at certain points where I was feeling like I need to write everything down until I feel better and until I figure all of this out. And that's probably not actually, no, not probably not. That's not going to be helpful as a part of OCD. But again, if you're journaling because you want to and because that's meaningful for you, um, I think that should be your reason, not because it's quote unquote good for your OCD. And it's also, can you imagine how much of a slippery sl slope is that? Like your OCD is just sitting in there and it's like, yeah, I'm going to have all that, all that room to create all kinds of thoughts. It's just like a perfect, perfect scenario for me to get stronger. So um, uh, I feel like it can be very, very tricky. Um, so maybe, you know, journal about something uh, that's not related to your OCD and see how that goes. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a great thought. So um, so thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of this comes down to the same thing. I always feel bad because I always feel like I'm answering the same way to each question, but it's ERP and do things that align with your values. Don't think do things that OCD is telling you to do. And that's that's kind of that's kind of where we where we are. This is OK. This is an awesome question. This is um, something I navigate with folks a lot. So um, is it OCD to feel that doing or not doing certain things will cause me to be punished? It feels more spiritual or faith battle than OCD. Not sure if it's one or the other or both. Um, so, yeah, so this is an area I work with folks um, a lot with um, my kind of other piece, faith and mental health integrative services. I do a lot around re religious scrupulosity with folks as someone with OCD and as somebody who's clergy. And this comes up probably with every single person I work with, not to offer reassurance, but this is, this is something that um, is incredibly common where regardless of faith tradition, individuals feel like they either have to engage in a ritual in a specific way or, oop, they can't do a specific thing or can't say a particular thing or can't pray or meditate in a certain way, or they will experience some sort of severe punishment. And yes, it feels like a spiritual and a faith battle. Um, but actually, one of our um, talks for the upcoming OCD conference is called... Um, it's OCD, it's not religion, or it's not a religious issue, it's your OCD. And that's exactly what, what I'll say here. Just like all the other things we've talked about from real event to harm, um, your OCD is latching on something that's the most significant to you. For folks that their faith, that their religion, that their spirituality is important, this is such a great breeding ground for your OCD to come in and say, okay, like I'm going to latch on to this and I'm going to make it feel really, really confusing for you. It is not a spiritual or a faith issue. It's an OCD issue. There are some folks that experience religious trauma that that can be a part of it. But for the most part, just generally speaking, it goes back to exposure and response prevention. 
and engaging with a clinician in exposures so that, uh, and some, some folks I'll say, get nervous about doing this when it has to do with religion because they feel like exposures are going to make them oppose their faith tradition. When in reality, it's you opposing the OCD so that you can get back to your faith tradition or to your religion in a way that's meaningful and value driven for you. I really like this um, question if you're if you're done here. Yeah. Um, I've been looking at uh, it's uh, the one at 8.53. Can OCD cause the realization, the personalization? Yes. OK, Um. got it right here. There you go. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a big one for me. Absolutely. I think that, um, I, like, I, I, I know that like kind of the personalization and realization are one of the symptoms that can come from severe OCD because your brain is just in a, such a, um, alert state for such a long time that it just needs to shut down some parts of your brain to calm your nervous system down. Um, and it's very counterintuitive because it makes you feel like you're going crazy, losing your mind. Um, and you feel like your brain is against you. While in reality, it's actually trying to work on um, keep your nervous system in balance and uh, make you feel um, more calm. It's very uncomfortable. But again, it needs to be treated in the same way as any other OCD um, thought, feeling, or urge, or sensation, or perception. You know, it can be like that, or it can it can change. I don't care. Yeah, probably we're all in the Matrix. Yeah, it's. I'm probably I'm gonna go watch Matrix just to get a little better understanding of what is going on. Just be very very sarcastic and try to not force that feeling away. Because the more you will, the more it's going to persist. I struggled with the uh, DPDR. Like that was that was how my OCD showed up. So it made me feel like I'm completely losing my mind. That's very scary. It can be very scary. Um, but it's a very normal reaction. It's a, actually a protective reaction of your brain um, that helps you. It actually like uh, saves your um, brain. So just letting it be and pushing through that as any other OCD symptom and uh, don't try to don't try to uh, chase a relief from that too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to hit on at least one more because I saw one too for me that I was like, oh, this, this, um, this really connects. Of course, I just lost it. Okay, here we go. Um, it seems pos impossible for me to accept that maybe I did, maybe I didn't saying as it relates to false memory, OCD and horrible things I may have done in the past. How do you get around this? Um, Sarah, as much as I know where we keep saying, well, it's not about the content and I still strongly believe that I know this can feel so tricky. Um, and this, this was one of my most challenging themes to get over because I said the same thing for such a long time. How could I possibly move forward with my life if I don't know whether or not I did something horrible? And what my therapist kept telling me was that if you continue to say, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, that, um, you know, you're never going to know the answer. And I, I kind of couldn't accept that. I had trouble getting my head around the fact that I would never know. But she said, eventually, you're going to stop caring about the answer. Eventually, you're going to stop searching for that answer. And I didn't believe her. I, I said, no way. Like, I'm going to be worried about this for the rest of my life. And she used to joke and she said, you're going to be the only one who's like 95 and still seeing me for therapy because you're still going to be worried about this. Like, yeah, I am. And you know what? She was actually right. The more I said, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, maybe it's real, maybe it's not, and actually sat with it without engaging in reassurance. And I'm not by any means minimizing this because it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And um, it was hard for a long time. But eventually I got to a point where it wasn't something I was searching for the answer for anymore. And yeah, I still today don't know the exact answer. But you get to a point where you kind of know, why is my nose? Yeah, you know what? It's probably OCD. And it's not something that I need to continue to give my energy to anymore. And it's this weird space um, where now I can look back and say, like, yeah, probably my OCD. Don't know for sure, but probably my OCD. But the only way to get there is to continue to say, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. And that's how you reclaim your life. 
And you deserve that. And the world deserves you regardless of what that false memory is or how you feel about it at this moment. And also research shows that the more you try to find an answer, the more uncertain you become. Um, so um, that's definitely like, you know, by uh, trying to answer that question, you're just creating more uncertainty and uh, just get more confused. And by saying, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Oh my God, I know how much anxiety it's going to create. I know how scary it's going to be. I've been there. So many people on here, they've been there. It's very hard, but it's so worth it. Mm -hmm. And um, it just takes a little bit of hard work to work on creating that space. And again, showing to your brain, you know, that's not really that relevant. I'm not going to care about that anymore. Mm -hmm. That can go away or stay. I don't know. I don't care. I love it. I love the, I love the sarcasm. Well, as we, as we close out, um, so first of all, and I'll give you a second to say goodbye to everybody too, but thank y'all just so much for being on here. I know we might not have gotten to all of the questions, but there were some truly, truly, truly awesome questions on here. And, um, and I really appreciate it. If you want to continue to get answers to these questions after you can plug into any no CD stream at any point, they are very, very consistently happening all throughout the week. Um, you can also always feel free to reach out to me at Rev K runs beyond OCD on Instagram or at faith and mental health integrative services. Also head over there to Instagram to check out my 50 ultra marathons in 50 states journey in partnership with no CD to make sure that everyone, everyone, everyone can afford evidence-based treatment. Um, and thank y'all for being here. Any final words, Julia, or where folks can, can chat with you? You guys, I know how bad it can get and how hopeless it can feel, but th there is such a beautiful life that's waiting for you on the other side of the recovery. Just keep doing the work and you will get there. And uh, one day you're going to be sitting there and thinking, oh, that Julia girl, she said that I'm going to feel very good. So, um, yeah, keep fighting and you're going to win for sure. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye.